For any function f of x, whose derivatives all exist, we can write down the Taylor series for f of x, centered at x equals a, by using this formula. But just because we can write the Taylor series down doesn't guarantee that the Taylor series actually converges to the function we started with. In this video, we'll address the questions of when can we be sure that the Taylor series converges to its function, and when the Taylor series does converge, how good is the approximation by Taylor polynomials, or partial sums? In other words, how big is the remainder? The answer to the question, does the Taylor series always converge to the function it's made from, is unfortunately no. Sometimes the radius of convergence is zero, and sometimes, even though the radius of convergence is large or even infinite, the Taylor series converges, but it converges to the wrong function. Here's an example of the second situation. If we look at this piecewise defined function, g of x is defined as e to the minus 1 over x squared if x is not 0, and it's defined so that it's continuous at, at 0 to be 0 when x equals 0, it's possible to work out the value of g prime at 0 using the limit definition of derivative. g prime of 0 is the limit as h goes to 0 of g of 0 plus h minus g of 0 over h, which is the limit as h goes to 0 of e to the minus 1 over h squared minus 0 over h. I'll rewrite this as the limit as h goes to 0 of 1 over h divided by e to the 1 over h squared. As h goes to 0 from the positive side, this is an infinity over infinity indeterminate form. And as h goes to 0 from the negative side, this is a negative infinity over infinity indeterminate form. In either case, we can use L'Hopital's rule to replace this limit with the limit of the derivatives, which simplifies to a 0 over infinity kind of limit, which is equal to 0. In a similar way, it's possible to prove that the second derivative of g at 0 is also 0, and so is the third derivative, and so are all the derivatives of g at 0. Therefore, if we write out the Taylor series, it's just the sum of a bunch of zeros, or the zero function. Certainly, this Taylor series converges for all x, but it converges to the constant zero function. And that's different from the function that we started with. In fact, the function that we started with, g of x, is not zero for any x except x equals zero. So the Taylor series only matches the function at the single point x equals zero and nowhere else. We found an example where the Taylor series converges, but not to its function g of x. Fortunately, this behavior doesn't happen for most of the functions that we typically deal with. To understand better which Taylor series are guaranteed to converge to their functions, let's take a look at the idea of remainders. For a function f of x and its Taylor series t of x, the remainder is written r sub n of x equals f of x minus t sub n of x, where t sub n of x is the nth degree Taylor polynomial. This can be expanded out as follows. Previously, when we looked at remainders for series, we wrote that the remainder was the infinite sum, which I'll call s infinity, minus the nth partial sum. The analogous expression for Taylor series might be the entire Taylor series minus the first terms up through the degree n term, but that's not what we define the remainder to be for Taylor series. Instead, the remainder for Taylor series is the difference between the function and the first terms up to the degree n term. The reason it's defined a little bit differently is because for Taylor series, we're super interested in the Taylor series converging to its function, and it's of less interest whether or not the Taylor series happens to converge to its infinite sum. Because we define the remainder as the difference between the function and its nth 
Taylor polynomial, it follows directly that the Taylor series for f of x converges to f of x in an interval around a, if and only if the limit of the remainders is zero in this interval. To see this, just note that the limit as n goes to infinity of the Taylor series equals f of x, that's what it means to converge to f of x, if and only if f of x minus this limit is equal to zero. We can rewrite this as the limit as n goes to infinity of f of x minus the limit as n goes to infinity of tn of x equals zero. Since the limit as n goes to infinity of f of x is just f of x, there's no n's in this expression. Using limit laws, we can rewrite this again as the limit of the quantity f of x minus tn of x equals zero. But that's just the same thing as saying that the limit of the remainders is zero by definition of remainders. So we restated the question about when does a Taylor series converge to its function as a question about when does the limit of the remainders equal zero. Taylor's inequality gives us a bound on these remainders that can help us answer the question of when the remainders limit to zero. This bound can also be a useful way to answer the question of how close is the approximation when we use Taylor polynomials to approximate a function. Here are some details about when this bound holds. Suppose there's a number capital M such that the n plus one derivative of x has magnitude less than or equal to capital N for all x's within a distance d of the center a. As a graph, this means that there's a number, capital M, and for all x's within a distance d of the center a, the graph of the n plus one derivative of f lies between negative m and m. So if such a number m exists, then the remainder r sub n of x of the Taylor series satisfies the inequality that the magnitude of r sub n of x is less than or equal to this bound capital M divided by n one plus one factorial times the absolute value of x minus a to the n plus one power for all x's in this interval of length 2d that we're talking about. Now in the statement of Taylor's inequality, the number m can be chosen just to work for a particular derivative. But really nice things can happen if we are able to choose the same number of m to work for all derivatives for all values of little n. In fact, if all derivatives are bounded by the same value capital M, then we can guarantee that the Taylor series converges to the function. That gives us a nice practical convergence criterion that I'll show you on the next slide. The practical convergence condition says that if there's a number capital M such that the magnitude of the nth derivative at x is less than capital M, for all numbers x in a certain interval around the center and for all numbers n, then the Taylor series for f of x converges to f of x for x's in that interval. I'll represent the convergence condition visually. This time we're agreeing that all the derivatives are within this bound. So the original function lies within this bound and its derivative lies within this bound and the second derivative lies within this bound. These are not necessarily <laughs> accurate representations of the derivatives, but that's the idea. So as long as the bound holds for all the derivatives, then the Taylor series converges to the function. And it's not too hard to prove this practical convergence criteria from Taylor's inequality. Remember that Taylor's inequality says that because of this bound m, the nth remainder is bounded by m over n plus one factorial times the absolute value of x minus a to the n plus one. But it's a fact that the limit as n goes to infinity of m over n plus one factorial times the absolute value of x minus a to the n plus one is equal to zero. And it's not hard to prove this fact by looking at the series and using the ratio test to show that the series converges. I'll leave that as an exercise for the viewer. 
Therefore, by the divergence test, we know that the limit of the terms has to be zero, which is what we want. Now, because the limit of this expression is zero, by the squeeze theorem, the limit of the Rn's has to be zero as well, which means that the Taylor series converge to the function. This practical convergence criterion is a very good way to show that Taylor series converge to their function. But even if it doesn't hold, it's still possible that the Taylor series may converge to its function, or in some cases, it may not. Let's use this practical convergence condition to prove that the Taylor series for sine x converges to sine x. Recall that the Taylor series for sine x is given by this equation. And recall also that any nth derivative of x for f of x equals sine x will have to be of the form sine x or negative sine x or cosine of x or negative cosine of x. That's simply because when we take repeated derivatives of sine and cosine, the values cycle around in between those four possible answers. Now, since the absolute value of sine x is always less than 1 or equal to 1, and same thing for cosine, we know that the nth derivative of our function has to be bounded by 1. So we'll let m be 1. And this bound holds for all x values, all real numbers. Therefore, we know that the Taylor series converges to the function sine of x for all values of x. We've used the practical convergence condition with m equals 1 to prove this. In this video, we defined the nth remainder for a Taylor series as the difference between the function and its nth Taylor polynomial. We also gave a bound on the size of the nth remainder. It's always less than or equal to m over n plus 1 factorial times the absolute value of x minus a to the n plus 1, where m is a bound on the size of the n plus 1th derivative of x for x within some distance d of a. Because of this formula for the nth remainder, known as Taylor's inequality, we can show that if the nth derivative of x is always bounded by the same m for all x within a certain interval around a and for all values of n, then the Taylor series converge to its function.